the question. Um, you may have asked yourself this, or you, you may not, but I think it's an important question that we, that we address. Have you ever wondered where money comes from? Not necessarily who prints it or who instructs people to print it, but perhaps where the value behind that $20 bill lies. It used to be tied to gold until 1971 in the US, but today it's kind of tied to nothing. And if you ever were particularly curious about where money comes from and you've tried to find an answer, then you may have even struggled to do that. It, it's quite staggering that even economists and bankers and policymakers are generally a little bit kind of in disagreement and a little bit of confused about where money comes from. I find that quite, quite staggering, really, for something which really forms the basis and the whole of our lives revolve around money to an extent. The kind of house we're going to be able to buy is determined by the amount of money we have, the kind of car we drive. And this sort of, for me, is, is, is interesting. I think we need to start to understand a bit more about money and think about what we used to do before there was money. Right now, things are not going particularly well around the world. Um, we're living in a time of, of economic upheaval. Uh, and we're not the first to do that. We've seen over the last 40, 50 years a pattern of boom and bust. And politicians continually promise to end boom and bust, particularly in the UK. And it just doesn't happen. We're currently going through a deeper crisis than we have done for a very, very long time. And people are hurting. People are hurting. And people don't necessarily deserve to hurt. OK, if the old banker gets hurt, then we can, we can settle for that, right? But you know, guys in the street, communities are, are suffering badly. But graphs are, are great, but they don't give us the full picture. What does this look like? It's unemployment queues. It's people losing their homes. It's empty shops. It's buildings up for sale. It's houses up for sale. It's family businesses that have been run by the family, in some cases for generations, going to the wall. You know, I, I look back with great fondness to my community back in Jersey, but I was born Jersey Channel Islands, and used to go to the butcher and the baker and the sweet shop, and they were all little shops, and everyone knew each other, and it was kind of wonderful, and everyone supported each other, and we kind of lost that. Empty town centers. This is a place in Finland I was in over the summer. This is the middle of the day. There's just no one there. You know, everyone's gone out of town. There's big shopping centers. Everyone's driving to out-of-town malls. It's kind of depressing, I think. This is my sandwich shop back in Cambridge. It shut down two months ago. You know, again, very sad. It was a really nice little family-friendly run sandwich shop. And, you know, if, if chocolate shops are going to the wall, then things have got to be bad, right? I mean, surely that's, everyone turns to chocolate when things are particularly, particularly bad. And people are, are unhappy about this. We've seen the Occupy movement. We've seen a range of movements springing up around the world. And people are demonstrating. They're going out on the street, and they're really making their voices heard. And it's kind of maybe the first time that we've heard these voices so loudly because of social media and the internet and so on. It's really spreading quite quickly. In Greece, which is one country that's been particularly hard hit, by the austerity measures their government's enforcing on them. Huge demonstrations now. And what's really interesting is the reaction to it, though. You can go on the streets, you can demonstrate, you can protest, but ultimately you're really not going to necessarily change very much. In Greece now, bartering markets are springing up all over the country. People are going back to earlier means of exchange, which have long gone in most of the places where I've been and maybe the places where you live. Why did we stop doing this stuff? Why did we stop doing favors for each other in exchange for favors? Why did we stop swapping and bartering and working together? When did we decide that money was going to be the only thing we used to exchange among ourselves? And these are the kind of questions I'm asking in this project, Means of Exchange. I'm trying to think about how can we mainstream different kinds of exchange so that on a daily basis we do a range of things. Money isn't always the best way to get what you want, right? You can do a favor for somebody, get a favor back. You can swap something you don't want anymore for something that you do want. You know, in, the, in the UK, I think one of the most um, largest purchases people make, but use the least, are drills. Right? You buy a drill, you drill a hole, and it goes in the shed. You know, and why don't we lend, we should lend everyone our drills, right? Then you wouldn't have to keep buying drills all the time just to drill one hole. It's kind of crazy. So I don't really have a lot of answers to this. I want to share some of the questions I've been asking, though, with you at the moment. And the three questions are this. How do we better buffer and protect communities from future shocks? You know, going back to yesterday, we heard that when things sort of get bad, we're all sort of thinking about how we can survive, and, and it's all very depressing and so on. And then when things get better, we kind of forget. We forget the hard times in many cases, and we just go back to the way we were. And if resilience is just going back to that line where we sort of started off in the first place, and we haven't really gone anywhere, we're still back to where we started. 
How do we find the way to reconnect communities with local business, local resources, but more importantly, with each other? It was the Queen's Jubilee this year in the UK. Saw pictures of those wonderful street parties where everyone in the street got their tables and chairs out, and they were all sharing dinner and eating and chatting, and just it was just wonderful, and that's just gone. When, when did we stop doing that? Why did we stop doing that? And how do we better communicate the local sustainability message? I think this is, this is crucially important, an issue of communication. Corporates do it really, really well. This is a McDonald's website from about 10 years ago. This was pretty cool 10 years ago, right? I mean, it's obviously now not quite the same. Here's Hotmail. Many of you may use Hotmail. This is how you would have accessed Hotmail a few years ago. Lego. This is a Lego website. This is pretty cool because they've got characters on it. What's interesting here, though, is these companies have moved forward and they're embracing Web 2.0, they're embracing multimedia and all the channels. The sustainability movement is still obsessed with Microsoft Office clip art, right? <laughs> Stuff, email me is spinning around, and, and people kind of think that's still cool, at least some people do, but that's not kind of how you do websites these days. It's really quite strange, and it doesn't matter how great the work you're doing is, it doesn't matter how important it is and how much it can change people's lives. If you're building websites that just don't communicate the message, then you're really not going to capture people, and we really need to capture people. The people who are mostly recycling and using local resources are the people that already have an interest in that. We want to bring people from the outside. We want to get people to think about this who may otherwise have not thought about it. And that leads me to this. These are the, these are the weapons of choice today. These are the things we have to figure out how to use in really interesting and meaningful ways if we're really going to get into people's heads and get into their hands. Twitter, Facebook, social media, smartphones. These are incredibly powerful devices. These devices didn't exist when the sustainability movement started kind of around about 40 years ago when Silent Spring was published by Rachel Carson. These are tools that exist now, but very few sustainability, local resource agenda organizations really use them at all, if, if even well. Games, right? Angry Birds, massive success. You can do some really very, very interesting things with games. People respond and react if you challenge them to something. Right? And this is, I think, a very interesting area. There's been a lot of work done in, in gamification. And there's some really interesting facts that people sort of voluntarily go out of their real world existence and they immerse themselves in a game and they voluntarily choose to fix something really quite difficult and challenging for no real reason other than satisfaction of having done that. Now, don't we have enough problems in real life to maybe switch some of that effort to solving real life problems? I think it would be fantastic if we could figure that stuff out. How many of you here use Foursquare? If anybody can explain to me what it actually is, then please come and see me after, because it still puzzles me. <laughs> About a year ago, they reached two billion check-ins, and uh, that's a pretty good figure. But people are battling to become mayor of a bus stop in their local town. I mean, it, it's kind of crazy. Like, what, what is all this about? But people are willing to press that button because it's a competition, it's competitive, they want to do stuff. This is Tidy Street in Brighton. This is a street which wanted to try and get people to lower their CO2 emissions, and they kind of try to speak to people knocking on doors. Not much of an interest. Suddenly, got this street artist to actually paint the aggregated value of all their energy consumption down the street. The middle line is the average for the city. The little line below is the average for that street. Suddenly, people who weren't really that bothered suddenly got really into this, right? And if they weren't doing this, they felt like they were letting the side down. It's now not about CO2 emissions. It's about keeping that yellow line down below that red line, right? What these people want to achieve is a secondary effect of what they're actually doing. And I think that's a really interesting thing to think about. Free rice, which was quite popular a few years ago, some of you may have, may have seen this, not particularly keen on this, but the more English vocabulary questions you get right, the more food people get in the developing world. You, they get bowls of rice, basically. Kind of a little bit touchy, but again, it drew people in in a kind of interesting and perhaps different way. This is something we did uh, over the summer in the UK. It's the cash mobs, and uh, we get people to show up using social media at a shop, spend a bunch of money, and uh, try and help support local business. Uh, we did it in Pages of Hackney, which is just outside the Olympic Village. The shop took $750 in 90 minutes and sold 100 books. It sold seven books the previous two days. It had its best day of the year. People were ultimately there because of the excitement of meeting up online and, and meeting up and, and feeling part of something bigger. And again, it was a secondary effect that the shop benefited. And some of these people had walked past the shop every day and never been in. So it got people again to think about what was available to them in their communities. And there was a cash mob just down the road, actually, two days ago in Camden. This is sweeping the US, more particularly in the UK. When we think about games and engaging people in really, really interesting ways, 97% of young people play games. And it's not a male-dominated thing either. 40% of women play games, and 69% of
of heads of households play games. If we can figure out how to get people to turn their game attention to real life problems, we can actually fix some stuff. Ultimately, I want to close with this. Ultimately, we want to go from this to this, I think. We want to start to think about how we can get stuff done without money. I think we need to think about having a, a healthy ecosystem of different means of exchange in our daily lives when that little bar's at the top, not just when it's at the bottom. And I think we need to remember that we're more valuable as individuals than the sum of the notes in our pocket, right? Which is kind of how we're measuring it today. This fantastic Einstein quote, I'm going to leave you this. Not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that can be counted counts. I think that, to me, sums up it up really, really well. And I'd love you to join me in this conversation to try and figure out how we can turn the technologies that we're using today for positive community rebuilding. Thank you very much. <laughs>